we're one week out from Easter, uh, one week out from planting another church. Uh, again, by God's grace, uh, our 6.5th church. Um, and today we're looking at the last of our assurances. Not the last of our assurances, but the last of the assurances that we're going through in this series. Uh, we've looked at the assurance of forgiveness. So you, you can be assured because of what Jesus has done. We are assured of forgiveness, assured of salvation. Man, it's amazing. It's wonderful to be assure, assured of these things. So that we're not <clears throat> each day wa- uh, wandering or wondering, thinking, oh man, am I, am I saved today? Am I forgiven today? Am I, am I not today? Or I feel good one day and then I don't feel good the next day. And so I feel confident one day and then shaky the next day. But rather, we have assurance of these things, assurance of victory, assurance of, of like this ultimate victory uh, over death, but also the, the assurance of victory over the penalty and even the power of sin in our life today. Wonderful, amazing assurances. Last week, uh, we looked at the assurance of answered prayer. And sometimes we, we think, man, we're just <clears throat> I feel like I'm speaking into the wind or speaking into the air. Is anybody listening? And so to have the assurance that God hears every prayer. In fact, he already knows what we're going to say, what we're going to ask before we even say it. And he, he wills, like he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to both uh, speak to us and he has spoken to us in many and varied ways and he continues to do so today. And he wants to hear from us. And so our prayers are not just you know, a shout of vain hope into the air, uh, but us communicating with the living God. Wonderful. And today, the last assurance we're going to be looking at <clears throat> is another one of those assurances, kind of maybe like last week where you think, oh, I, how is this an assurance? It's the assurance of guidance, that we can be assured that God doesn't just want to guide us, but is presently, currently guiding us. And so you might think, <clears throat> yeah, but I've, <laughs> I've asked him for help before. I, I have, uh, you know, I've had a goal and I've, I've wanted to know how to get there or I feel like I am just afloat in a vast ocean of the unknown and the unknowable. And I don't feel like God is kind of, Leading me at all, I feel like just wherever the wind is kind of blowing is wherever I'm going. I don't know, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how to get there or how I'm going to get there. Uh, how can you say that we have the assurance of guidance? Well, actually, I hope today, I hope today that I'll be able to show you primarily from Scripture that God not only wants to but is presently guiding you and actually promises guidance. That we have the assurance, just like we have the assurance of victory, just like we have the assurance of salvation, the assurance of forgiveness, the assurance of answered prayer, we likewise have the assurance of his guidance. And so uh, I'm going to pray, ask God to help us, and then we're going to get stuck in the scripture and see what he'd have for us today. And so, Father, I want to firstly just thank you in faith for that assurance you've promised us. We see it in scripture. Many of us, we've experienced it in our lives. Father, my hope, my request today is that you will help us to understand and have confidence in, build our foundation upon the promise we have from you that you will lead us, you will guide us, and you'll be with us always. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that we ask. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, so often, I don't know if this is like you, but so often it seems to be when we go to God for guidance, when we want his direction, what we're really asking is not, not <clears throat> with a zoomed out overall picture of our lives, uh, foundationally God, take me from the very kind of essence of who I am to where you want me to be. And it's more like, well, I've already decided most of what I want to do. And now in this very narrow band, of what I haven't yet decided, 
God, would you help me to distinguish between these options that I have placed in this narrow band? Tends to be, <clears throat> probably, not, probably not for you guys, but for most people, even Christians, it tends to be this is how we approach guidance. We have already taken off the table everything else. We've, we've kind of decided in our own right, th- this is the direction we are going. In fact, these might even be the goals that we want. And so my guidance, God, is help me to get to where I already want to go. In this narrow band, this narrow field of vision that I'm blinkered to everything else that, that might be around. I don't want you to help out here. I certainly don't want you to bring any of these options into my field of view because I've already decided this is where I'm going, but I need your help to get there. Uh, but I don't think that's actually how, firstly, how we're built to operate in life. It's not how God has promised to guide us. Uh, It's not helpful for us. We have been given an assurance of guidance. But because we start so far down the process of decision making, often we've actually, we've kind of blinkered out or elbowed out the very path God would have us tread. And so when we say, oh, how come, how come I feel like I'm asking and I'm not getting any guidance, God? You're not helping me to get to my goals because the way he wants to guide us isn't even in our field of vision. We're, we are blinded or deafened to his leading and his guiding because it's not in accordance to our will. This is what <clears throat> the writer of Proverbs said, uh, writes. Chapter 3, very famous verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. So with everything you have. Trust in the Lord. And remember, every week, basically, we've started with, how, how do we if, we, if we can acknowledge that there is an assurance of these things, how do we actually lay hold of these things? How do we build our confidence into those assurances? How do we actually claim those assurances for ourselves, if we can put it in that way? Every week, we started with the trustworthiness of God. Actually, the, the competency of God, the majesty and the might, the faithfulness of God. <clears throat> and here again, the writer of this proverb starts with, trust in the Lord. This is where our hope comes from. He, he is the one we can build all of our hope upon. So trust in the Lord with all your heart, with everything, and don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him, or acknowledge him, your version might say, and he will make your paths straight. So again, he's saying, don't rely on your own understanding. And so uh, by that, when we come to decision-making uh, or guidance from our own perspective where we've already gone a fair way down the path of decision-making and blinkered, uh, blinkered our lives to, to, to kind of much of what God might have for us, <clears throat> when we read this, we actually go, okay, we don't want to lean on our understanding. But with all of our ways, we need to know him or acknowledge him or seek him. And therefore, in our decision making, when we ask God for guidance, we need to come right back to the very start. Put all of our trust in him. Put all of our hope in him. All of our faith in him. All of our allegiance to him. And and it's, it's here where I'm going to show you, this is where we can start to build and walk confidently in the assurance of guidance. It's going to be very difficult if we're starting down here where we've built our path based on our own understanding and now we're just asking God for the last little bit of help. Help me achieve my goals. Get me there. But rather if we scrap all that and come right back to here, trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding but acknowledge him, trust him, put our life upon him, he will then make our paths straight. This is the foundational, this is the big idea. The big idea is this, you are not adrift in the sea of the unknown or the unknowable. It may feel like that, but but you're not. God has not pushed you out to try to figure things out by yourself. He's not the God helps those who help his own. Like, go figure it out. And if you can get yourself to 90%, I'll get you the rest of the 10%. That's how we think about him. 
That's not how he wants to relate with us. He's like way back at the very start, at 0%, build your life upon him and he will direct your paths. God is trustworthy. When you acknowledge him in all your ways from the start, he will direct you. So it means you're not alone. Actually means you're never alone. It means that you aren't unknown. It's not like when nobody knows how I feel. Nobody knows my experience. Nobody knows what I've gone through. Nobody knows the challenges I currently face. <clears throat> Nobody knows the unknowable in front of me. Nobody can empathize with the different kinds of decisions and the weight of picking the right or the wrong one to me and to my future and to my family or to a, a you know, broad sphere of influence. But rather you do. You do have somebody who knows you, who loves you, who is imminent, intimately aware of everything that you're currently going through. And more than that, has promised to guide you, is, is with you and leading you and guiding you. What we want to do today is do some of the work of finding out how do we walk in that assurance? How do we kind of, how, how do we live in that? How do we do that? Well, the, for today, purpose of today at least, there are no less than five ways God's given us to help discern his guidance. And they are through his scriptures, through his spirit, through his family, that's us, <clears throat> through his wisdom that comes from above, and through his creation, which for the purpose of today is your brain, your reason. He has, he has made you incredibly uh, to join with him in this purpose. We tend to look for two different kinds of guidance. So there's a general guidance, what works for everybody, or what are the, how has God made us as people? What, what if, like the, if you go to the Psalms and go to the Proverbs, they're full of what you might call conventional wisdom. If you live this way, this is the kind of life you should expect. <clears throat> call it conventional wisdom and not necessarily promises because we live in a fallen, sinful world and we are still beholden to some degree to the, the effects of other people's sin. So we can do things very well. You might say, if you... If you save and invest well, you will have money for the future. But that doesn't count for, account for people stealing from you or uh, just the, the negative effects of other people's greed on your own life. And so you might do, this is why uh, places like you know, Ecclesiastes are so important for us because it kind of helps us to understand a different area of wisdom, which isn't the conventional wisdom, which is you do everything right and you still die. Or people are really wicked and they still seem to succeed. And so um, we can look at general guidance in Scripture uh, in, in those five areas. But then you might also look for specific guidance. So out of these three options right in front of me, what is the, what is the best thing? Or what's the thing that God would have me do in these? So today we're going to look at both general guidance and spe specific guidance through those five things. There are many more than those five. These are the five we're going to look at today because otherwise we're going to take a very long time. Let's look at Scripture. So general guidance from God, He promises it. He's promised. We have the assurance of guidance. The primary, like the, the foundational way He gives us this guidance is through His Scriptures. Throughout Scripture, we see descriptions of the character of God. What is God like? Who is He like? We see prescriptive commands where he says, do this and don't do this. And sometimes they have promises attached. Do this and it will go well with you. Do this and you'll live long in the land. Do this and you die. <clears throat> and we see descriptions of the people of God, how they act, how they, what happens when they obey God, what happens when they disobey God. We see general guidance throughout Scripture, which answers the questions generally, answers the questions, what does God want for me? And what does God want from me? So if you, and again, this is why I say we're, we're not just going up to the 90% of, well, I've got these three 
choices ahead of me. And I need God's guidance on which of the three. But rather, we're going to come all the way back to the very beginning and start from here. And then we'll get, I promise you, we'll get to those things later. What does God want for me? What does God want from me? Because we've got to start there before we get to the, well, what do I have for breakfast? Or what vocation should I pursue? Or where should I buy a house? Or what kind of person should I marry? Or what do, now that this really terrible thing has happened to me, what should I do next? Before we get there, we want to ask these foundational questions. <clears throat> what does God want for me? What does God want from me? Paul writes about this. And First Thessalonians, he writes, Brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, do this even more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is God's will. Have you ever wondered what is God's will? Paul actually explicitly says it. This is God's will, your sanctification. <clears throat> So what does God want for me? He tells us in Scripture, verse 1 and 2. He basically writes, We encourage you in the Lord Jesus. Commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Do these that you're already doing and even more. So saying these are, these are actually commands from Jesus. These aren't just good ideas. These aren't just culturally contextual to like 50 AD. These aren't just Paul's you know, 12 rules for life. These are commands from the Lord Jesus, is what he's saying. Uh, you know, given by and through King Jesus. And what are, the commands, what are the commands about? They're about how to live and how to please God. No, not how to appease God. He's not talking about salvation. He's not talking about works righteousness. He's not talking about if you can just live this life like this, you will work your way up to the love of God. He'll love you if you climb this moral ladder and get over this kind of threshold. It's not what he's saying. God is already pleased with you. God already loves you. He doesn't need to be appeased. He's for you and he's with you. And so when Paul's writing, like, how, we, how should we live? What, how do we obey these commands? What are the commands that God has already given us do? They, live, uh, they teach us how to live, how to please God, the God who already loves us, the God who has already saved us. In giving these commands, he says even for the, for the Thessalonians, it's a reminder. He says, you're already doing it. You're already living this way. It's amazing. You have been given these commands by King Jesus. You are living in them. And Paul says, do them even more. You're doing great. Keep going. Live like this. Why? He says, because it's God's will for you. There's a couple of places actually in Scripture where uh, the Spirit shows us explicitly this is God's will for you. This is what God wants for you or this is what God wants from you. So First Thessalonians 4, we, write, we read, is your sanctification, your Christ-likeness, that you become more and more like Jesus, that you'd reflect his image, think more like him, love more like him, lead more like him, relate to the Father more like Jesus, relate to others more like Jesus, relate to sin more like Jesus. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Like be in that communication with the Father who loves you all the time. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Or you go to Colossians 1, it says, uh, what's God's will? Bear fruit and know God more deeply. Or Ephesians 5, he writes to the church in Ephesus, what's the will of God? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. All of these just different angles, or different aspects of the same will which is God drawing you to himself and making you more like him. That's what God wants. What does God want from you? That you would become more like him, that you'd, that you'd come to him, that you'd be in a relationship with him. What does he want for you? That you become more like him. This is, this is if we want guidance, the foundational guidance God give, has already given us, and it's the constant guidance through scripture, the constant guidance through history. What does God want? from us and for us. He wants you. He wants you to be with him and he wants you to be like him. And he's done everything necessary for those things to happen. He's dealt with our sin. He's even dealt with death. 
so that we could be with him and like him. It's wonderful. It's one of the reasons we can have such assurance of his guidance because what he's guiding us to is the thing that he wants. And he is acting in accordance with his will, which is our sanctification. So he will guide us into our sanctification. The rest of uh, this chapter in First Thessalonians gives us examples of what that life looks like. And there are other places in Scripture that gives you examples of what that life looks like. And we don't have time to go into it today, but I highly encourage you to read the rest of that chapter and see, again, before we get to the, you know, which of these vocations or study or relationships or whatever should I, should I pursue, he said, come back and first ask, first ask these foundational questions. What do you think about the guidance? You know, again, it's, uh, we do want to get to the what should I do now or what should I do next, that kind of particular guidance. And we need that kind of guidance. Again, uh, not so much when it's a question of, well, here's a good option and here's a bad option. Which one should I, which one should I use? Uh, or here's a, here's a, you know, should I um, do something positive or should I do something negative? These are easy kind of things to kind of figure out uh, in, our, in our own right, even. Um, but when we're trying to think about those kind of significant life altering decisions where if we make this choice, it excludes other choices. If I marry this person, I can't marry these people. Uh, if we decide to have another child, we can't then not have that child. Uh, if I buy this house, it means that I might not be able to buy that house. Or so if I choose to live in Adelaide, it means I can't go live somewhere else, etc. And so not only do we want to ask those financial questions, we also want to ask these other bigger questions. Not even bigger questions, just questions that we won't randomly open Scripture or even through the whole breadth of Scripture won't necessarily tell us what should I be eating for breakfast today or what should I wear today and those kinds of things. But as we live in obedience to Scripture, we want to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and defer to him in everything not just the last 10%, but in everything. I also put it to you that the more we work on that foundational guidance, the easier it is with the specific guidance. The more we build our life on Jesus, the more we partner with the Spirit in that sanctifying work of thinking more like Jesus and loving more like Jesus, the more clear these decisions will be to us, or the less of them we stop at and stumble over because we've done that more foundational work of becoming more like Jesus. All right, secondly, his spirit. <clears throat> uh, one commentator, Sitzer, he says, he asks the question, is God's will, is his guidance for us some specific secret plan that he wants us to spend days or weeks or even years discovering? He says, not at all. Rather, it consists of a sober life, living in the power of the Holy Spirit and offering praise and gratitude to God for his goodness. Paul's main concern is about his believers conduct is about his believers uh, conduct how his believers conduct themselves in ordinary life. And so what we do is we look at the scriptures and we see, say, Paul going from town to town doing miracle here and prophetic word there and amazing thing there and healings over there, and we kind of condense decades of ministry and life into a few pages we can read in minutes and we go, this is the typical daily life for the average Christian. But we actually gloss over other parts where we see actually, it's, if we just condense it to the highlight reel, we can look at our lives and go, man, of course God is not guiding me. I don't see his guidance. Look at the amazing, phenomenal, extraordinary guidance that God does in this people's life. But then when you look at some of the other ways, like, for example, check out, <laughs> check out how Paul handles some decision-making about where to go next. Where should I travel is, what he's, is the question he's answering. Acts 20, as is Luke writing. Going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us in Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene, and sailing from there, we came uh, the following day opposite Chios. The next day, touched at Samos. The next day after that, Miletus. 
Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So as you read this, you hear this incredibly mundane. Well, I want to be here by this date, therefore I'm going to make these decisions along the way. Super mundane. Using the wisdom God had given him, he decided to go a certain place by a certain time. But then there are other places in Scripture You hear about the big kahunas in the early church writing a letter to the church. And this is what they write. They say, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you, not not that Judas uh, and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. You abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality If you keep yourselves from these, you'll do well. Farewell. This is the letter that they write to the church who are trying to figure out what is the will of God. And this is what they say. It seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. So if you do these things, you'll do well. Farewell. It seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. What about when it came time to choose a place, a replacement for Judas? That Judas. Here it is, 12 apostles of Jesus, leaders in the church, carriers of the true doctrine, like the the ones who we form when we talk about the doctrine of the church, we base it on the apostles' teaching. This is how they they made this decision. They picked two guys. They got them to draw straws to see who got the short one. That was the one. So imagine like at at the birth of the church, right? How are we going to decide who is going to be one of the 12 apostles at the pillars, the foundations of the church. We're going to pick two dudes and get them to draw straws. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. What we don't want to do is, uh, we don't want to do is lean into fatalism on the one hand where we say, well, God's in control. Therefore, it doesn't matter what I do. <clears throat> Therefore, I'm just going to go for it, whatever it is, and just ask God to bless me along the way. That's not what this is saying. This is not an invitation into fatalism. Um, but neither is it a, an invitation into some sort of hyper-spiritualism, which says, well, I'm going to hear from the Holy Spirit on every aspect of life. And I can't move until I hear from him. You hear even Paul talking about where he goes in other places. Well, I wanted to go over here, but the Spirit prevented me. It's not like he waited for the Spirit to tell him what to do. It was kind of as he was going, he was trusting in the Lord with all of his heart, not leaning on his own understanding, but acknowledging God in all of his ways and God directed his paths. And this is how we engage with the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, To... Not ruin, to condense an Augustine quote where he says, Love God and do as you please. Where he's basically trying to say, If we love the Lord with all of our heart and don't lean on our own understanding, as we go, we, because we're joining in God's work of sanctification, us becoming more like Jesus, thinking more like Him, relating more like Him, as we go, if that is our goal, If our goal is the same as God's goal, our sanctification, we can basically do what we want because we will do what he wants. And we trust that as we go, because we're not leaning on our own understanding but loving him with all our heart and acknowledging him in all of our ways, he will direct our paths. Thirdly, his family. I do want to talk more about how do we hear from his spirit and we'll do this in the context of family in a minute. Our God has gifted us, not just the scriptures, which are wonderful, and not just the Holy Spirit, which is, he's amazing. He, he is God himself with us. He's gifted us this family. We are not built and not meant to do life alone, abstract from the family of God. He's gifted us each other. Another proverb, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. And so I think there's a threshold to that, you know, uh, you want to ask some people and not necessarily everybody because you'll get too many different 
uh, ideas of, of what to do or where to go. But I fully believe that we are a spirit-filled community. So if we want to hear from the Holy Spirit, that's not just one single vertical relationship you and God, but it's also a multitude of horizontal relationships you, a spirit-filled child of God, and we, the spirit-filled community of, community of God, that you will hear the Spirit of God speak through other people as you search for and look for wise counsel. First Peter, he writes, as each one has received a gift, minister it or serve it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I mean, he has gifted us a very varied and diverse group of people with different backgrounds and, uh, and ideas and education and interests and experiences. All the one spirit, but all very different people. And man, we are, the, the we of us is such a gift to the, to, to the I of us, if that makes sense, the individuals here. Yeah. That we have a community that also love the Lord, also partnering with him in that sanctifying work, also want to use our gifts to serve one another. How did the, you know, after the apostles chose the, the 12th apostle by, you know, by lot, <clears throat> how, do they, how do they then decide on a very important task that needed to be done, recorded in F6? Uh, there was a group of people being neglected in the daily bread distribution and they needed help. So they just went to the church and said, hey, church, choose from amongst yourselves Seven men who look like this. They went to the church and said, you guys sort it out. Discern amongst yourselves. We all have the Holy Spirit. We all have uh, varying, again, experiences and education and we can discern. Let's discern together. Sort yourselves out and decide. Fourthly, God has gifted us with reason. He's given you a, a brain and a mind to be able to actually work things out. Not abstract of the other things. Again, that's what gets us into the trouble in the first place. When we only use our reason and we travel the 90% of the way with our reason and then we go, oh my goodness, now I need to get some help. Let's go find some people who love me who can help speak into this. Uh, let me ask the Holy Spirit. Let me search the scriptures. Uh, that's kind of, that's the backwards way of doing it. Uh, but we don't want to neglect our reason. It's an amazing, wonderful gift from God that he has given to each one of us so that we can reason. God even tells Isaiah, he says, let's reason together. Don't neglect this wonderful gift that God has given you. Again, we don't want to err on the side of fatalism where uh, we just, whatever it will be, will be. We don't want to err on the side of this hyper-spiritualism where we say, well, I don't need to use my brain because I'm just going to, the, the Spirit will magically download everything I need. No, 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 we, we're doing this in partnership with God. It's how he's made us. It's wonderful. Jesus, Jesus says, uh, which of you, Luke 14, wanting to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation and cannot complete it, the onlookers will begin to ridicule him saying, this man started to build a wall and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he's able to with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If not, while the other's still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Now, in these verses, Jesus is talking about counting the cost of following him. But the, what he uses is the gift that God has given us of our minds. So I mean, we must use them. God has given them to us. We don't trust them alone. We don't lean on only our understanding, but we do have understanding that God has gifted us to be able to use. I'm still amazed when people ask for help or for guidance about a thing, uh, and I'll say, well, who have you asked? What, what's your current thinking on this? Have you even, like, have you Googled it yet? Uh, people say, well, no, I haven't asked anyone, haven't Googled it but I'm stuck. 
I'm like, oh man, but God has given us like an amazing ability to reason to varying degrees, you know, among us. That's why we need each other. And I'm certainly not saying to blindly trust, you know, what everyone says on the internet at all. Uh, but we're living in, in an age where we have uh, phenomenal access to data and God has given us an amazing mind to be able to put data together. Again, we don't want to lean only on our own understanding. That's not what I'm saying. But we're partnering with God in utilising the, the reason he has given us. And fifthly, not exhaustively, we want to use that reason. We want to apply that knowledge with wisdom. So Romans 12, again, we've, we've been here before uh, this series. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So that you can apply knowledge and reason in a way that leads to God's glory. That in a way that leads to or puts you on that path that he has prepared in front of you. Does that make sense? Or James 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, if you don't have the wisdom or you can't reason your way to it, or, or in wise counsel, uh, in going to the, the body, we can't discern what the thing is. Do you lack wisdom? I don't know what to do with this data. I can't reason my way to the, to the path ahead. He says, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. We don't go to God asking for wisdom, and then he's like, oh, I didn't want to reveal this to you, but... I see that you believe in Jesus and so you've, you've caught me out and now I have, to, I have to do it. Or you found some sort of cosmic loophole or, oh, oh boy, I was hoping no one would figure that out or I really enjoyed watching you kind of flounder about. None of, the, none of those things. God gives ungrudgingly and generously. He wants, again, what it... What is God's will for you? He wants you to be with him and more like him. Ungrudgingly, generously. The, the path that leads to that, he wants you to be on that path. He wants to, he's made that path straight. Notice it doesn't say easy. It doesn't say simple, but it does say straight. He, that's what he wants. And when, when we align with his will, and we want that too, he gifts that to us generously and ungrudgingly. So ask him. If you lack, ask. If this, then that, and he will give you wisdom. And that wisdom may come through the scriptures. That wisdom may come through another spiritual believer. That wisdom may come through counsel, may come from just a de you know, direct download from the Holy Spirit may come from you know, something un un unlocked in your reason. Um, but he says he'll give it to you. That's what he wants. He's not a hard taskmaster making you figure it out by yourself. He's not up there going, oh, well, you passed that and you failed that, or tick cross, tick cross. I wonder if this guy's, girl's going to figure it out. No, he, that's, he wants it. He wants to give it to you generously, ungrudgingly. That's his desire for you. He said, become like Jesus. We see it over and over and over again in Scripture. It's what he wants. Let's go to him and ask him, and he will give it to you. Let's, let's wrap it up. Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. We have the assurance of guidance. What we don't want to do is just start up here with the last 10%, but in all of our ways. Let's start back here and ask, what does God want for me? What do, because that'll answer a bunch of those questions down the road before we even get to them. What does God want from me? That'll answer a bunch of those questions, again, before we even get to them. And then when we do get to those things, we're like, no, I don't know. I can't just go to Scripture and, and see, it doesn't tell me which suburb to, buy, to, to rent a house in or buy. Should I rent or should I buy? It doesn't tell me which job I should be going for specifically. And that's when built on the foundation of acknowledging him in all of our ways, we can go to the very many and varied ways that God has given us and again assures us of guidance. And here's what I find 
second most comforting after the fact that God assures us guidance is that for us, God's will for us isn't that we achieve our goals. God's will for us is that we are drawn to him and become like him. So even when we pick a particular goal, or we, you know, we, we decide to not buy that house and then it turns out that was the wrong decision or we start this job and not that job and this job <laughs> turns out to be terrible uh, or, or for whatever reason, we think, oh, I wanted his guidance and this season sucked or that didn't seem like the right thing, or I didn't get to my goal, therefore my guidance was wrong. But if we zoom out, we see actually, what is God doing for us? He's making us more like Jesus and he's drawing us to him. Those things go beyond a temporal context to the degree that like Augustine says, love the Lord and do as you please. There is a degree to which it, it does and doesn't matter which of those specific choices you make. Because God is, in all of them, drawing us to himself and making us more like him. And that is our goal. And God assures us of guidance towards that goal. And that's the thing that we were made for. And so we can have total confidence in God's guidance. We've got some work to do in our discipleship groups, uh, talking about our, you know, that general guidance and then specific guidance. And please, if you haven't done it, ask God for wisdom. Ask your discipleship group for wisdom, that they'll be praying for you, that they'll be speaking into your life. And please be speaking into, be using your gifts to minister or serve to the body as well. Uh, let's pray together. So Father, I want to thank you for all of these five assurances. You're so good to us. So please help us to live life in light of these. Build on the foundation of these. The assurance of salvation, the assurance of forgiveness, of victory, of answered prayer, and of your guidance to us in every circumstance. And Lord, help us to not trust just in our own understanding, but to trust in you, build our life on you, Put all of our hope in you. Acknowledge you uh, in, in every aspect of our life, from the very beginning, not just when we come up to a question. Lord, thank you for your, your proximity to us, your imminence, your care, your loving kindness. Thank you for your patience when over and over and over again, we do lean on our own understanding and we neglect you or we, we pick our own narrow path and ask you to bless it. We're, we're sorry, please help us to see the, the foolishness in that way of living. And in every way, Father, help us to lean on you, fixing our eyes on your precious son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.